Hello. Hello. Nicole Shapiro. Alina Gabash. I'm going to go over here for a second and put the link on our actual page. Yay. What do us? Hello, everybody. How are you this fine gray morning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was supposed to be sunny today. At least it's not quite as cold as it was last night. For those of you not in Seattle, it's really cold here for a change. And we are here today to talk about consent. So do you consent to be here? Yes. I do too. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for those of you that are new to the work that Alina Gabash and I do together, we do a bunch of stuff, Yeah. but um, these Facebook live sessions are really about our conversations around raising kids without sexual shame. Um, and the topic that we really wanted to have a conversation about today was consent in practice. Um, and you know, I'm in both sex ed and birth education worlds. And so we talk about consent in the birth room, but today we're probably going to focus mostly on consent around sexuality, which we're super thrilled because consent culture is even a thing like that's progress. That's huge progress. Huge progress. Right. Yeah. Um, but we are, um, you know, Alina and I are both, I think, in worlds where we are watching people want to perpetuate consent culture and practice consent culture. And it's just not always that easy. And when we look at things in a very black and white way, there's no room for education and there's no room for growth and there's a lot of room for shame. So since we are... Um, fully behind the belief that shame is the opposite that shame hinders discernment which is necessary in consent culture being able to be discerning as we interact sexually with one another um we would say that we need to shed more light on the topic of consent culture and more light on the aspects the practice of consent and how it, it it's kind of hard yeah, we 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 have a story kind of there's a conversation going on where it's really that easy. Oh, it's yes means yes and it's always enthusiastic and we have to do it just this way. And then it comes up and then you're like, but did I consent? Am I sure I consented? I think I consented. Mm -hmm. um, did you consent? I don't know if you consented. And we end up having, uh, we end up doubting ourselves. We end up uh, doubting our partners. And um, because sex is always not about cerebral consciousness enthusiastic keep it in your head head i'm you know sometimes you go away when you're having sex sometimes and and for some of us it's because of trauma we go away mm -hmm. and for some of it's because of we just get into our bodies so much and then how do you express consent when you've quote unquote gone away mm -hmm. you know those kind of things are things that we need to talk about and to be conscious about and um and not shame people if people have different views of how they achieve consent than you do, which is something that I've encountered more often than not recently because of some of the amazing new things we've done around consent is that there's this attitude, well, if it's not enthusiastic, yes, 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 all the time, then you're being, have your consent being, is being violated. And I don't necessarily agree with that. So well, in my so, own personal life. Well, and yeah. so let's even talk about that phrase, right? I mean, Alina said this word to me as we started talking about this morning where she said, um, I'm just going to share this in a couple more places. Yay. Um, she said this term, enthusiastic consent. And I said, where are you getting that term? I don't even know where that term is coming from. Because here's, here's my, cons and she, you know, she found it's some things everywhere. and showed, showed yeah. me where it was being said. But here's my concern is... What does enthusiasm look like? What does enthusiasm feel like? You probably have a different understanding of what That's enthusiastic right. consent looks like, feels like, sounds like than I do. And what we know is that a lot of people are informed around sexuality, not from places that are taking sex ed very seriously and looking at it deeply, but from television or from pornography or from friends who watch television or pornography. So, or from past experiences that well, no, yeah, have, sure. have caused and created other kinds of con conversations in your brain and in, your, in yourself. So, so yeah. my concern about the term enthusiastic consent is that some people are very, um, what was the word I used? Are very, uh, you know, dramatic in the ways that they show 
that they're enjoying their pleasure, right? Um, they're exhibitionists. That was the word. So you could have an expectation that enthusiastic consent looks like somebody who is a um, extrovert expressing their pleasure. And then um, when you don't see that, you don't know that the person is experiencing pleasure because they're very internal. Yeah. So what does enthusiastic even mean? So really what all of this speaks to, I think, is it a desire to make something very complex, simple. What I do like <laughs> is words. Words can be very generally fairly simple. Do you want to do this? <laughs> I would like to do this. Would you like to do this? Is um, a pretty great way to get a sense of consent. Um, and even then sometimes... We hear people after the fact say, wow, I said yes, but I really didn't want to do that, which is that's, something that's, that you, that's right. you've talked about. And, and, and so my biggest thing is, is, is being responsible for the choices we make and making conscious choices. And, and I'm from an era, I'm in my 60s, that um, she, she was talking about enthusiasm, for example, uh, is that we were supposed to show enthusiasm when we had sex. So I grew up without verbalizing sex sexual response because my first sexual experiences were um with my hand and in the quiet of a bedroom that i shared with my brother and sister and so i never had didn't even know you could make noise during an orgasm until i had a partner that say are you having fun because i couldn't tell and i'm like oh my god and so i started to make noise but i didn't really know what kind of noises i was making and uh and i also i mean i i didn't know you know you mean like this noise Ooh. No, more like this, oh, 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 you know. But. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, which noise are you looking for? <laughs> and I come from a culture that faking it was considered okay. And women faked it all the time. And I'm guessing they probably still do. I quit doing that a while back, by the way. But the reality is, is that's how I, I showed my enthusiasm was to fake enjoyment when I really didn't give a shit. Um, because sex was kind of, eh, for me. So let me you know. ask you, in the context of that, that's a really great example. Um, would that confuse you as to whether or not you were enjoying yourself or not? Absolutely. Right? Because you're so busy trying to fake it. Well, I wanted to make them feel happy because that was my job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which, that's changed now. That has totally changed. No, but um, what you're yeah. speaking to is is generations of experience that we're all trying to recover from, which That's is right. part of what consent culture is. I mean, what we're what we're doing exactly. is we're saying too much of sexual interaction has been based in rape culture, and we would like to evolve that to consent culture. And that's not going to happen because someone writes a blog. It's not going to happen because somebody teaches a workshop on consent. That's right. This is a this the difference between theory and practice in sexual um, interactions is is vast. It's a, there's a big difference between me saying that I believe in consent culture and then actually in the moments of sexual engagement, let's say an hour of sexual engagement, the moment to moment decisions that are made at any point, where is their consent and where is their consent violation? You know, one of the things we talked about was the confusion of some people get turned on by consent violations. Yeah. yeah. So is that a consent? You know what I mean? Like, are, do you, and this is part of what I've been so grateful for people like yourself who've been involved in BDSM for a long time because there is an attentiveness to negotiation. Yes. You do, mm -hmm. you do say, you know, a good example would be to have that discussion. Are you turned on by consent violations? I'm turned on by violating you. Would, is there a way that we can figure that out? I mean, it's a pretty maybe extreme thing for people to hear, but that's the truth. But there are people that, but that is part of their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, that I keep coming up, up with is the fact that so much of our sexual interactions is unconscious, are unconscious. We are not conscious about when we enter into it, we don't talk about definitions. For here's an example is mm -hmm. define what word sex means. We got Just, a whole workshop on it. That's, I mean, that right there is, is huge. But if you end up having a, a relationship with somebody and you're like, so you can, we can do anything but no sex. Well, what's that mean? Can I touch your genitals? So, can I not touch your genitals? When I'm making you know? this point to people, I, when we teach our what is sex class, we have a, sh we have a 
five page line by line like imagine expel self spreadsheet that no one has changed the size of the it's like lines, 11, 11 right? point or something five pages of that that we have everybody click like check whether or not they consider it sex or sexual so five pages five pages so you got somebody that thinks something's sex and someone else thinks it's not sex and you've both agreed to not have sex that's right what does that mean and I had somebody come to me when I was the director of the center that that was it. They felt that their they their consent had been violated because they said they were going to do BDSM but no sex. And this person allegedly, according to them, did something sexual. And uh, they touched their taint, which is for her was sexual. You have to. You might have to say what the taint is. That's the space between the 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 vaginal opening and the anus, the taint, right? And when I met with the top and another woman, and I said, I've got this consent violation accusation, blah, 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 and we talk about it. And I said, she accused you of, of doing something sexual. And she goes, I didn't do anything sexual. And I said, you touched her taint. She goes, that's sex? And her, I mean, she was really like, obviously like disturbed that that was considered sexual and that she felt horrible that this person had felt that her consent had been violated. Um, so one of the things, again, it goes back to consciousness and about choice, but being conscious and having conversations about just what things mean to you. I know in the middle of sex, I don't want to talk. I'm like, no, no talk in the middle of sex, which means I have to talk a whole lot before I have sex because mm -hmm. I want to make sure that you know what I like and mm -hmm. you do, we want, we're going to do things that we both enjoy. Mm -hmm. But after we start, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to constantly be going, yes, do that, yes, do that, yes, do that, except when I when I want to. I mean, that's the other thing is sometimes I feel like that, but most of the time I don't want to talk during sex. Yeah. So I think that what you're speaking to, and you know, as I'm thinking about this in the context of raising kids without sexual shame is, um, I've said this before, which is that as a parent, I think that I am a sex educator every day. Um, and one of the ways that I consider myself a sex educator every day to my children is around the topic of consent. Yes. Um, and, and that comes up in contexts that are beyond, I mean, that's in life, right? Like, does she consent to you being in her bedroom right now? Could be, you know, a simple one that's not sexually charged per se. It's just whether or not she wants somebody else in her bedroom and trying to, um, lace into everyday life a conversation around consent. That's right. So that then when we get to, and this is one of the things I wrote in the um, explanation about today's discussion, when we get to a place where our body is starting to have a lot of sensation, can we still have a clarity of our boundaries and a clarity of where our consent is and when we are playing edges around that? That's the other thing. So I think we're talking about really, um, I say that I really like embodied nerds. I do. I really do. So that means people that are both really smart and connected to their body, right? This is, this is, that's very sexy. It's very sexy. And it's me. I mean, I'm kind of like that, right? I fall in that are. category. And so what I find around the topics that are related to sexuality is often people just want to have a body experience and they, they take their brain offline. And, I, and, and I've even had some of the most intelligent people I know say that to me. You know, you were able to say, I don't want to talk during sex. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've had people say things like, um, I don't want to think while I'm having sex or I don't want to... Um, I don't, uh, sex should just be a mystery. Now, the, the thing in those situations is then if you're taking your brain offline and only your body is engaging in the sexual behavior, you're very vulnerable at that point. That's right. And, 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 and maybe this is what you desire and there's some level of, of owning the fact that that's what you've done and you can negotiate that beforehand. That's, that's exactly where I feel about it. So when one of the things that we forget to do because we, and this is not just in having sex, this is in relationships, everything, we quit to talk about it. We, we forget. 
We don't have conversations. Which is we just, why we want to raise kids without sexual shame. That's right. To learn to talk about it. We expect our we expect our partners to read our minds, to know exactly how, what you didn't know I wasn't enjoying myself. You know, we, we, we expect that. And so if we know enough about ourselves, like, and I coach people all the time, if you know about yourself that you like, um, that you are not, say, vocal during sex, then it is up to you to let your partner know that ahead of time. Say, I'm not going to say anything during sex. And that means it's up to your partner then to check in with you if they're concerned or have a feeling mm -hmm. because you're not going to speak. Mm -hmm. But you need to speak that up ahead of time. You need to give your partner choices. Uh, conscious. You, you need to be conscious about your choices so your partner can be conscious about their choices. But if you don't tell them and then all of a sudden you're like, you know, that was a really crappy lay we just had. And, <laughs> and, and they're like, but you look like you were enjoying it. Well, I wasn't. Then, is, but it felt good to me. That's right, you know. So, so we need to be responsible for our choices and responsible for the the things that we choose or choose not to do. And if we choose not to tell our partner something important, then we cannot hold our partner responsible for violating that thing that's really important to us when we've never told them. They have to know. So we have to speak it up ahead of time. So what I'm thinking about is, remember that meme I made about the muzzle of shame? Yes, I love that. So yeah. this is a big ask. It is a big ask. When we live a big ask. Big ask. Big ass, big <laughs> ask. It's a big ass, big ask. <laughs> when we live in a world that has applied over and over and over again what we call the muzzle of shame around the topic of sexuality, it is a huge ask to speak it. If you can speak it, you're already having the courage for change. That's you're right. already having the courage for, for um, practicing consent culture. If you cannot speak it, um, we are more vulnerable to the previous paradigm, which has been rape culture, That's right. which I will say personally, I think is in part because of the muzzle of shame. If we've, here's the problem. I mean, and we, we just kind of played this out when you were talking about the example, which is, but it felt good to me, doesn't mean it feels good to the other person. And we all have varying degrees of ability to connect with another person's body and understand if it's working for them or not. Some people do it really well, and some people do it really poorly. We can build that ability, it, but it's a skill to assume that because one person is having a good time sexually, that the other person is having a good time sexually is a dangerous assumption. That's right. That's right. I would say it's a dangerous assumption. And again, it goes back to having the conversations. We... We we talk about all kinds of things, but when it comes to sex in relationships, we we're not going to talk about and it. And then we just think it's going to magically work out because you know exactly what I want, don't you, baby? Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really don't like it when you do that, but I'm not going to tell you I don't like it when you do that because because I might cry and then you might cry and I then I'm going to be and, uh, heartbroken and, and then you won't get to fuck me and you'll be very sad. <laughs> I would be so heartbroken. Mm. Which, you know, I mean, right. And, and so this is this is one of the things that has continues to educate me as a sex educator as a sex educator is how vulnerable sexual um, triggers are and and the wounding that often uh, we come up um, we come we are confronted with when we are engaging sexually with another person. Um, so that would be a good example, right? I start to do that. You say, I don't like that. And a part of me never wants to talk to you again. Right. And then you feel abandoned because how could I never want to talk to you again? Just because you said, I don't, I don't like panting. That's right. right. And, and it is a very vulnerable place. So again, the more that we can, um, have the courage to educate ourselves about sexuality and the courage to speak, the courage just to speak up. And the courage to I listen find, when somebody see, speaks. So, so, so this is this is what's tricky, right? And I was on um, Gina Kirby's Progressive Parenting Radio earlier this week, and I was talking about this, which is, um, you know, when Alina and I started raising kids without sexual shame, one of our um, assertions very early on is, no one's an expert on how to do this. 
Uh, but we think it needs to happen, so we're just going to show up and start community dialogues about it. Um, and so I think we need to understand that about consent culture as well. Um, for those of us that have been involved in change, cultural change, so social change, right. uh, through for decades, I was born into it. It's not my fault. Blame my mother. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, is the we know that it's messy. And we know that it works better. Um, yes, we need to stay clear on the, the intention. The intention is consent culture. But we also need to create spaces of compassion and messiness and places where we can be imperfect about it. So I will say, let's have the courage to speak. But what if the only words that a person has are really offensive to another person if i the only words i have to tell you what i like sexually the other person finds offensive we end up in a situation where now i don't even think we can talk about it right, right. so i finally had the courage to say to you i really like fucking you in the ass and the other How person dare you? right exactly <laughs> right then it's going to be that much harder for me next time to even say that while yes you've gotten some amount of feedback that maybe those aren't the best words with that person um or the best way but we we really well i'd like that you use the word compassion i think we we forget to be generous and compassionate with the people that are in our lives because sometimes we get uh, quote unquote triggered by something and we just blurt out uh, anger or fear and we forget that they also have their angers and their fears and their lack of self-confidence or whatever that might be. And, and again, I'm going to go right back to conscious choices and talking and we, we and compassion. And compassion. Let's, let's say that, that we need the whole compassion. Package. It's yeah. really important. And, um, you know, you were talking about I, I I really think that this is why, and again, this is another reason why raising kids is, I think, is so important, is that if we start with our children at a young age, teaching them about consent in all their life, then when they reach that age where they decide to have, they choose, they choose to have a sexual relationship with someone, we've already given them the, the foundation and the tools you know, but we violate our kids' consents all the time. Uh, when we say, uh, well, I can give you an example of a friend of mine's um, former husband, or ex-husband as she calls him, because they're not, they're not, they don't get along that well, um, non-consensually cut their, their, her son's hair. Uh, he didn't want his hair cut either. And it was done really poorly. It wasn't done professionally. And uh, he's like, well, he's my kid. I can do what I want. Mm. And instead of realizing that a seven-year-old child gets to choose they do we we need to respect our children's consent we need to say can i would you like to get your hair cut you know and then if they say no then stop and think about why are they saying no instead of pushing your way through it but it's that way with we do this with our children all the time well and i'll you know? say the other side of that is that my kids violate my consent all the time oh yeah also right and so part of what i've grown into as a mother is to point that out Yes. <laughs> Where I used to feel like as a mother, it was almost my job to, to just, yeah, like yeah. that I would martyr myself over and over again and just let them do whatever. Now, I will also say that the way that my husband deals with that is different than the way I deal with that. He has very stiff, very black and white lines of consent. And I'm kind of cool to negotiate it back and forth. I'm cool to have them like a good example would be we're snuggling and I'm reading a book and I'm reading a book to them, to one of my kids and they will not stop fidgeting. That violates your consent. <laughs> <laughs> and I can feel that I'm getting really upset because I'm trying to read a book and nonstop things are like moving all around my body, right? <laughs> and so what I try and do is before I'm ready to throw them off the bed, which I've never actually done, but you know what I'm saying, um, is, okay, so I'm going to need you to stop that soon or else we can't cuddle while I'm reading this book, right? So it's like, and what I feel like I'm doing there is teaching them, A, that they can not wait till the point where they want to throw someone across the room. And B, that I matter. In and that boundaries. And that their behavior is impacting me. Right? This is some of this conversation around impact and accountability is if I, as a mother, am not expressing to them the impact of their actions. And that's different than saying... You're annoying. You're so fucking annoying. Get the fuck off of me, right? I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I'm saying my I'm starting to get annoyed by your behavior, by the way you're work, you're you're touching my body, and I would like that to change. I would have loved that kind of response when I was a child, because what happened then is because I didn't have that response when there was there was this expectation of 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 trying to read people's minds or getting you know yelled at at, at the at, at after you had reached that way beyond those boundaries, is that I grew up to be sexually acquiescent. Mm-hmm. You know, if I could tell my 16 year old self anything, it would be to tell her to say no more often. Mm-hmm. But, but it was part of the culture that I was raised in. And that has to, goes all the way back to the lack of consent as a child. I didn't live in a house where, I, where my consent mattered. You know, right. there was no consent uh, acceptance in my, nobody asked my opinion or what I wanted or, or gave me choices or talked about boundaries. I had to figure it out all on my own. It took me a whole lot of years like way too many right and you're not alone in that and so that's you know again as we're trying to be social change activists and head in the direction of consent um as being the expected behavior um it's going to be messy and it's going to be complicated and it's going to require a lot more conscious language and conscious dialogue and a lot of compassion and do not confuse compassion with an okay with deviating from consent culture right. we're not saying it's okay to not have consent unless it's pre-negotiated but we're saying that on the road to successfully attaining consent culture within our society we're all gonna fuck it up that's right no one's gonna do it perfectly because they read a blog about it it's just that's that's the most ridiculous you mean the blogs aren't, aren't gonna make it make me perfect God. Uh, and and one of the things that I really want to be clear about, and this is for me, and I know of other people who feel the same way, is that this the idea of the enthusiastic consent doesn't always work for me. I am I believe in what I call ho hum consent, and that's um, I love somebody so much that um, and I've had I've done this with with a partner. They're like, you know, I'm horny tonight, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not really that horny, and I love them. And it's not that I have to, because if I say no, they'll say, okay, and they'll wander off and do whatever they're going to do. But I'm like, okay, we can have sex. But it's kind of ho-hum. And so, it becomes maybe enthusiastic later, or maybe it doesn't. And it's totally okay, but I get to choose that. It's my choice. And because I choose to not be enthusiastic, doesn't mean that I am having my consent violated. So the first time Alina said this in a class, I got really upset, right? You know. <laughs> because... No way, Jose. <laughs> like, I'm not down with that. But this is part of... Uh, we're all different. That's right. Right? And, and when we... You know, I wanted to say this earlier. That part of the trick of the compassion around sexuality is that um, being... Society will very quickly support anybody that's um, triggered by um, sexuality to be righteous. And... Um, that righteousness state doesn't often lend itself to social change. So um, being able to both know that the aim is consent and hold a space of compassion within the space of sexual triggers is a, it's a big ass ask. (laughs) A big big ass ask. I like that. I'm not going to minimize that. Um, but I'm also not going to act like avoiding that will get us where we're trying to go. That's right. So, um, anybody got a question? We got two more minutes. There's not a lot of people on the call today. Um, but if there's anything that anybody wanted to ask, we got these two more minutes that we could ask, we could answer. We filled up a half hour pretty fast. That was pretty yeah, hard. I think it's a really big topic. Um, you know, you can always go to, um, the Raising Kids Without Sexual Shame page on our, our Facebook page. And if you have a question that you'd like the community to um, dialogue about on that page, just private message it to the page um, and we can do that. Otherwise, you can always work with Alina and I separately yep. um, as coaches. And then we also, I have a peer counseling um, curriculum that's focused on sex if you want to build your courage around being conscious about sexuality. You can find me at eroticcoaching.com. That's my my website. Ooh. Oh, and also the Foundation for Sex Positive Culture has just started um, an amazing uh, program called the Consent Academy. So good. And if you just Google Consent Academy, you'll find them. And basically what they're doing is they're creating 
classes on consent to take to colleges, take to other groups. And they're working right now with the University of Washington for their first, their first class and we're very excited about it. And um, to give good education about, con healthy education about consent um, to places that aren't getting it. It's so good, right? Yeah. So this is, this is, again, we're gonna just keep creating more and more spaces for us to be able to talk about this and have conscious conversation about it. Um, and then, you know, hopefully at some point we can also do some work with them around, um, and in practice, there are a lot of sensations happening in the body while you're trying to mm -hmm. dialogue about consent in the context of sexuality. And we can't act like that's not happening. Sex isn't a purely cerebral, it's, well, some people think it's very cerebral, but you know, it's like there's, you're also having sensations in your body that to manage, it's not like just when it's you're, complicated. Yeah. As Gina and I can also, we shared about brainwave states, right? So if we are in a beta brainwave state while we're reading a blog and then we're in like alpha or theta while we're having sex, like we might not connect all the. I have a friend whose wife was reading a book while they were having sex. I wonder where she was at. Yeah. No. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Bye. See Thank you. Later.